going to have an exciting, frightful <laughs> <laughs> program. We want to make sure that everybody knows about the garden tour that we'll be having. If you've never been on one, it's fabulous. Kathy works really hard at finding interesting gardens. We, every, every garden is different. Every year is different. It's just kind of a fun event to be able to look and see what other people in Yankton are doing with their yards. And it's amazing. It's just amazing the variety that we come up with and, and how interesting people create in their yards. And that's going to be on Saturday, June 22nd. And your tickets will be purchased at the Reformed Church on Penina. And early, Burley. Yes. <laughs> what did you say, Burley, Burley, Burley. Yeah. <laughs> Move over, Burley. Move over. And um, with your ticket, you will be able to tour the yards and then come back to the church, and we'll have a salad luncheon there, and we'll also have a plant sale at the church. <laughs> so it's not to be missed because... You know, you just never know what ideas you're going to get from somebody in, on these tours. It's just kind of amazing what people are doing in their yards. So, and I think they have kind of amazing plants. Last year I bought, I don't know how many plants, for a landscaping area at the school in Abel where I live. And every single one of them came back. So, yeah, it's amazing. The plants are great. The gardens are great. And the lunch is great. So, what you got to do? And the lunch is terrific. So, with that, I'm going to let Dan talk about the monsters behind him. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Um, this uh, talk was uh, kind of assigned to me. Um, I am by no means an expert on like lots of perennials in your yards and things like that and what their bad behavior may be. I know more about it now than I did, but I've always been really interested in the biology of why, why plants um, that have been introduced to our environment, uh, some of them behave themselves and stay put and, and others don't do that. So um, I'll delve more into that and kind of talk about some of the historic things that have happened with some introductions that have gone wrong, have gone bad, and then more of a modern day look at some of the types of plants that um, may be on the verge of becoming a problem or are already are a verge or, or, or already a problem uh, or are problems in our neighboring states that, that really need to watch out for in the future. So, so this is about uh, the invaders from the nursery. There's some invaders that we just have to take home with us from the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> so last year I gave a talk about invasive plant species and um, so I, I reused, recycled some of the slides uh, for this, but um, most of this is all new. Um, I was interested in like when a, a nursery offers plants for sale, do they have any laws governing, governing what they can sell to the public? And so I, I kind of delve into the, um, the South Dakota law and there's really not very much regulation at all what a nursery can do. A nursery has to register with the state and there's, gosh, there's um, hundreds of them registered. But the main thing that, uh, the Department of Agriculture is looking for is they don't want a nursery to sell plants that have diseases. They don't want to have people selling plant stock and stuff that maybe has some sort of insect infestation that, that they don't want to get that spread around. But there's very little control over what they can offer. And so there are plants that, um, that are known to be very terrible plants that you can order online. So this, um, and with online, I mean, there's probably even a lot less control. So the um, the thing that is restricted is anything that's proven to be really detrimental to agriculture. Really, ag kind of is the big driver of any kind of regulation of plants in, in our state, 
uh, a lot of the ag states, not so much on the coast. You know, they have other um, interests besides just agriculture. But if a, if a plant, um, say you're gonna buy some grass um, mixture for a pasture, um, the Department of Agriculture makes those nurseries selling that, uh, or the companies selling it, verify that they don't have any of those upper weeds in there to any any degree. And then the ones below that, I know this is kind of small, but there's some they have some tolerance for, but, but so they, they regulate things that affect agriculture a lot more than <clears throat> regular stuff that we're buying. Um, in Yankton, there are um, weeds that get designated noxious. This varies from county to county. There are there is a state list also, but the the list there on the right hand side are the ones that if uh, the weed weed board notices you have or your neighbors turn you into the weed board, those are the ones that you're supposed to be controlling. And if you don't, and it gets too out of hand then they'll go spray and take care of it and then charge you for it. Um, I have heard though that if you don't pay, they don't have much authority to go after you. So some, some people just ignore it. Um, so why do we even care? Because it's extremely expensive. It cuts into the production in the agriculture. It's, uh, it, it damages the the quality of the crops, it takes away food for animals that are being pastured, um, and it just keeps climbing as the years go by. It's um, more and more and more. Um, a little bit of definition, you know, we have, uh, we have native plants and we have non-native plants. Both can become invasive. And uh, an example that we have locally is the eastern red cedar. I mean, that's been here forever. It evolved for this environment after the Pleistocene Ice Age and the glaciers receded. Uh, but because native prairies got burned all the time, it only survived in areas that were sheltered from burning, like riparian areas and outcroppings of rock. Well, once we Europeans settled um, and we stopped burning, it's just been more and more and more of these trees all the time coming up from the south uh, primarily. Um, so that's, that's an inv that invasion we'll talk more about you know, a native plant. But there's um, probably um, more problems with non-native invasion. And the probably <coughs> classic example of anybody who's been down south has seen the kudzu that was introduced and it just can take over and cover everything. And as that picture shows, what was the purpose that it was introduced, do you know? Pardon? What was the reason that it was introduced? Or well, was it by nature? Well, kudzu? Yeah. yeah. Kudzu was used by highway departments after construction to help uh, stabilize the soil. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's been the reason for a number of the things we'll talk about, so, that stabilization of the soil. But what they found for a lot of those things as the decades passed is that you get, you get these things growing, and then nothing else can grow underneath. You have bare soil, and then that leads to lots of erosion, besides not having any, any of the regular plants and animals. It's supposed, it's supposed to be there. Um, so um, a little bit about, so we've introduced many, many kinds of plants, and the vast majority of them have been really great. You know, they've been food, like wheat was introduced, uh, corn was introduced, tulips, you know, beautiful things like that. So we've introduced tens of thousands of species since European colonization happened here. Uh, there's probably 5,000 naturalized introduced plants. Um, but there's something they call a 10% rule that of, of the plants that are introduced, only about 10% really survive and, and, and thrive. Of those 10% that survive, only about 10% will in invade or escape and do things we don't want them to. So really the invasion is usually less than 1% of introduced plant species. So why why do those plants, oh, I want to talk about this guy real quick. 
So Mary and I were just up at um, the Macquarie Gardens on Sunday and they had a plaque about this guy. And then as I was you know, researching this, I ran across his name again, Benny Hansen. He was um, a South Dakotan uh, at the um, a horticulturist that traveled the world. He was uh, the first USDA plant explorer that traveled the Orient, uh, <coughs> Canada, <coughs> Canada, Europe, Russia, all over the place. And he's responsible for 412 plants being introduced into the United States. And uh, this list is just the crab apples that he found across the world that he brought. <laughs> his, his list is extensive. And he, you know, he did so much good. He introduced many grains and things that that did well here to, to feed our ancestors and, and to this day as well. But you know, he, he also introduced some plants that, that weren't so great because at that time there there was really no no really appreciation that this could be a problem. It, one of the take home of this lecture is how many decades it can take to find out for sure whether something is going to be a problem or not. So some of the things that make plants become invasive um, are characteristics that give them a, an advantage. And one immediate advantage a lot of them have is that they've evolved on a part of the earth through thousands, hundreds of thousands of years dealing with a certain climate, certain set of insects, uh, amount of rainfall, whatever, they've really become fine tuned to certain conditions. But some of the plants um, just have, they're not very picky. They, they can get by with a, a wide variety of conditions. So you take a, a plant, for instance, like kudzu, um, you bring it to a, a place where now it has no pests um, because none of the pests that have evolved to eat it or help keep it in check, they're not there anymore. Um, and they often do things like make hundreds of thousands of seeds or they have roots that go really deep. Um, they may release chemicals into the soil called allelopathic uh, tendencies that can make it so other plants don't grow. Um, they just can have genetics that make them very plastic, meaning they can adapt quite well. And um, they may have seed, seed strategies where they, you know, we see this all the time. They have little birds. So the mouse that comes by or the deer that goes by picks up the seeds. The birds, you know, eat it and maybe get diarrhea from the seeds, so they start pooping the seeds all over the place. They, they just have these tendencies that give them an advantage over the native species that are competing against the animals that want to eat it or the, you know, the plant disease that wants to infect it. So lots of native species, when they're plucked out of their environment, put in a brand new one, it's like they have no competition. That can be a bad situation. <laughs> So um, as I indicated, the, the competition um, here can be, can be so profound that it can alter the environment. It can al alter the habitat. And they've uh, determined that of almost a thousand threatened and endangered species that we have, both plant and animal, 400 of those are negatively impacted by invasive species. So uh, it's, it's a, a bad deal and ultimately it just sort of leads to a decrease in biodiversity, which is always a, a less than optimal situation. Um, so we've, we've all had invasive species that um, I can give you an ex example, um, you know, like, like I'm going to talk about the calorie pear. One of my favorite trees that I've got in my yard uh, is the calorie pear. <coughs> Sorry to say, but um, because I see so many birds eating eating on it, and I think, well, that's that's good. But so it is. A lot of these things do have uh, nutritional value to certain species, but the birds, for instance, that 
come to this calorie pair that I've got, they tend to be uh, starlings, uh, sometimes some robins. Um, we get cedar wax wings. Those are always fun to see, but not very many. Whereas, so, so what happens, or maybe there's only a few kinds of caterpillars that are found on that tree. Not very many as compared to a native species that has evolved in that habitat, it's going to be the home to many more caterpillars. It will be providing maybe a habitat or food for many more types of birds. There, there are many grassland birds that are pretty, pretty um, particular about what they want to eat or where they want to be. And we've seen, um, really over the last 30, 40 years, a big drop in the population of our native grassland birds. And a lot of it's because we don't have nearly as many oak as we used to. Uh, you know, a lot of the, 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 lot of the grassland's been replaced. It's not even grass anymore. It's row crops or it's infested with cedars. So by having native species in the habitat, it's, it's a much more complex web of life. It's, uh, if it's non-native, it tends to be fewer individuals and not as complex, not as diverse. Um, the, um, I mean, <coughs> there's a book, of Doug, Doug Tallamy's, the, the guy that writes about um, the backyard national park and, and doing native species, and he's done a lot of research about the foods that's on oak trees. And it's incredible how many more uh, caterpillars and insects and stuff there are in oak trees that are then the food source for many, many types of birds and other animals. And this, this graph here kind of shows when they've done the research like oak, cherry, maple, basswood. If you look at the native varieties of those types of trees, the amount of caterpillar diversity is you know, twice as much on all of those. And, um, you know, things that are that are introduced, like the ginkgo or um, some of the other maples and things, hard, hardly any kinds of caterpillars. So it's just a sort of a food desert for the, the a lot of the species that would rather have other things. They just plain don't eat them and then their populations decline. Um, you know, this is a little bit more about non-natives. Um, uh, this, this source that I found is talking about $20 billion per year to control non-natives. And um, there's you know, the, the invasive uh, ornamentals are, four, are 40, 40 times more likely to become invasive than native ornamental plants. Um, one little thing, I, we'll talk a little bit more about the barberry plant, but they've found that when barberry escapes and becomes uh, out in the forests and the grasslands and stuff, it does something that makes it so there's way more ticks in those habitats. So there's even issues with uh, human health because it's the ticks that carry Lyme disease. So we haven't, you know, I'm going to be curious to kind of poll you guys whether you've ever seen this, but in states not very far from us, including Minnesota, um, there's um, evidence that the, the barberries having invaded may lead to actually more human disease because of the tick thing. Um, and when and when these things invade, um, what happens is that there's lots of plants that have very strict criteria for what allows them to germinate, what allows them to grow what allows them to produce seeds and propagate and the more and more we degrade our habitat the less likely we are to see this host of other plants that you know this is a list from game fish and parts of the rare plants of south dakota i'd hardly ever heard of any of these let alone seen them and these are the things that are out there on the forest floors out in the native grasslands and stuff that um they just kind of get choked out by all these other things. And so they become rarer and rarer to the point some of these are already extinct. And I told this, this, this is just the one, this is just the scientific names that start with A. I mean, the list is as long as my arm. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the mistakes that we, we've made in the past. You know, I'm not shaming anybody. Nobody knew at the time. But if we study these examples and see where we're at with these plants now, it kind of gives us a starting point to maybe be wiser in the future. But, and, and these are the things I just, I'm going to delve into it a little bit more detail. Um, we'll start with the buckthorn, because I think this is probably locally the biggest problem we've got. And it's still not on very many people's radar. But um, it was introduced in the 1800s as an ornamental shrub or small tree. Um, again, locally, we had big problems with purple loose stripe we'll talk more about. Garlic mustard is all over the state park now. Um, we have the Phragmites is lining, you know, the Missouri River in many places, and, and, and along with purple loose stripe is really degrading our shorelines and changing that habitat a lot. Eastern red cedar is crowding out um, native grasses and making it so some of these lands they can't even run cattle on anymore because there's no food there anymore. It's just all cedar trees. And then we'll, we'll touch on a couple other bad players here. Salt cedar, Siberian yellow, Russian olive, and tree of heaven. Um, so the, the buckthorn, um, it, it kind of came, you know, it was a problem in Minnesota quite a long time ago, and before that, bigger problem in Wisconsin. It's just gradually been creeping to the west and kind of has come up the river systems here. Um, but it, again, Mary and I, we did with, uh, we did the Missouri River. Uh, cleanup, and we went over on the Nebraska side underneath the Meridian Bridge. That is all buckthorn underneath there. It's all the big cottonwoods, and the entire understory <clears throat> of that is cotton, is the, the common buckthorn. You cannot, with without tearing your coat up and stuff, go through that. And um, it's, it's a lot of places Did along. Did you do that this year, Dr. Johnson? Pardon? Did you do that this year? Uh huh. Yeah, and, and so Marnie Creek's got a lot of it. Yeah. And, you know, Coral's seen it a lot along some of the Corps of Engineer land. So this this was um, this was an area, this was down along Marnie Creek a couple of years ago. Um, why is it so invasive? It, like I alluded to, um, it has these berries. I'll show them to you, but they, the, they cause a catharsis. The birds eat it. It makes them have diarrhea, they poop the seeds. Same thing happens when <coughs> mice uh, eat them, small animals. So they distribute their seeds really well due to these animal vectors. Um, they're not really fed upon by insects and deer, um, so they don't have that pressure. Um, when they are cut or are broken, they vigorously re-sprout. And pretty soon what happens, you just have a monoculture with a uh, a shade layer that's robbing all the other plants of having any photosynthesis, and the understory becomes just pretty much bare, maybe some weeds, um, but, but just not very many native species anymore. Um, buckthorn is really easy to, to identify once you kind of know what to look for. Um, it has these little horizontal things called lentils, lentils. Um, Pretty distinctive. They do have thorns. Um, there are it is dioecious, so there's male and female plants, and the females will have the black berries, um, and they carry those berries all through the winter. They get fed upon. Um, they this is a tree that leaves out real early in the spring, and it holds its leaves well past other trees. So. This is easy, easy to identify, especially in late October and November, because it's about the only tree that's leaves on it. And um, you, to verify, you can just take a knife and just scrape the bark. It's kind of a bright orange, pretty easy to tell. Um, has the berries through the winter, like this. This is down at the bike path at the state park. Um, it's hard to get rid of. You physically have to go in and cut it and treat it, pull it. Um, but it is, it can be done. Um, so purple loose stripe, we have a lot of that around here also. Um, 
on the garden tour last year, I noticed people had planted purple loose stripe in their gardens, still still available. There's cultivars of, of loose stripe that uh, claim to be non-invasive, but from reading, they, they said it has a tendency to hybridize with the wild loose stripe that is invasive. And so the genetics can change, even though it's a cultivar that's supposed to uh, remain put and, and won't be invasive, they often do switch and become invasive. Garlic mustard um, brought originally again in the 1800s, maybe late 1700s, uh, as a food source and also for medicinal qualities. And um, so it's edible, but if you go walk the bike path or go to the horse trails, out at the state park, it's just carpeting throughout everything right now, all the white flowers. Um, again, it's, it, it makes thousands of seeds. This, in the fall, when you walk through the dried, brittle remnants, the seed pods explode and blow the seeds all over the place. So it's really adapted for spreading. Um, it, it's a uh, a biennial, so it has a, a basilar year when it's just rosettes down low to the ground. Second year it bolts when it forms the flowers, and then it kind of looks like a bunch of dried sticks, but those at the ends of those are all seed pods and they'll they'll burst. Um, this is this is literally what it looks like at the state park. You know, a little bit later than now, but it's it's well on its way to doing this right now. <laughs> Um, Phragmites is a, another concern. This one's kind of tough because there's a native Phragmites that is, you know, evolved to be here, and they're pretty hard to tell apart. Um, there's ways I, I certainly couldn't tell one from the other, and I would like someday to see one next to the other. But um, it it really affects the shoreline habitat. It can make it so that the waterfowl can't utilize the shorelines as well. Um, it can lead to flooding because it can uh, cause uh, more s stabilization and, and lead to, um, you know, when, when we get um, extra rainfall and there's more water moving through, there's just less volume available because the shorelines gradually creep in, partially because of the fragmites. And it can be a big fire hazard. So it's, it's once it all dies and stuff, it's a huge fuel load that it gets sets on fire. It's just really a hot, vicious fire. Um, Eastern red cedar. So this is a, a plant, like I say, it's native. Um, it, it survives, you know, it, so for that reason, this is out of Nebraska, um, but for 91 years, you know, the state agencies in Nebraska and same thing in South Dakota, this was promoted for uh, windbreak, shelter belts, things like that because it could actually survive. And in, in doing so though, what they found, and they first started noticing this in Texas and then Oklahoma, then Kansas, Nebraska, now it's full, full, full of boar in South Dakota. You just start to you kind of start with just a few cedars, maybe just a little bit from your shelter belt. And within honestly 10 years, it can look like this. And it just takes over. And so, um, you know, Bernie Hunoff and the South Dakota Magazine, he did a really nice article, and the name of it was The Green Glacier. And this is what's happening. And this is a big deal for ranchers, people that are trying to run livestock, because um, that canopy that forms makes it so grass doesn't grow underneath. And then it becomes a bit of a habitat desert itself. You see crows, you see robins, you see a few birds that eat the juniper berries, um, maybe some white-tailed deer that hide in it, but it's um, it's a very, um, how should I put it, it's just not diverse. It's very poor quality land when that happens. If you want to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> when you said that Nebraska had it for 91 years. Have they finally stopped giving that out for Well, that's a good good point. I think there's more communication between agencies now. So you'd have one agency that was helping people 
trying to clear their pastures and then another agency that's distributing the trees. And, and they're, they're aware of the disconnect, but there are, there are places where almost it's hard to get other things to grow. So it's always been kind of a go-to species, but there is a recognition that maybe it's worth working a little harder or watering a little bit more frequently the first one or two years to put in a different kind of species instead of this one. Would, would you concur? Uh, yeah, but I was going to say a few more. You know, we look at the slides here. Go down on uh, Southwest Jim River Road, uh, which is about two miles out on Whiting Drive, and then go, go west to 303rd Street. Mm -hmm. You'll see how quickly Eastern Red Cedar will take over the, the yeah. hillside. It's I impressive. own the 110 acres out there. I'm glad I don't know. <laughs> well, so, so the NRCS, the old Soil Conservation Service, now rebranded, but they're really promoting um, formation of prescribed <clears throat> burning associations because fire is, that's what controlled it in for eons, and that's what's going to control it now, too, is by burning the, the pastures and, and Kind of battling it back and so these pbas are uh, being promoted and we just formed one uh, southeast south dakota prescribed burn association and corals a, a member and i'm a member and so um we so i'm gonna take a, a moment to do a commercial here <laughs> so when so everybody's got a, you know, some trepidation about people just going out and starting fires because you know there's homes and stuff out there amongst some of these cedars. And so this is this is where Mary and I live, and uh, I wanted to do a prescribed burn on these these two pastures, which I had. We've lived out there since 1991, and on two occasions I've gone in there originally with a shear, had some some guy shear on and get the trees out. And then the second time was uh, on a skid steer, a big rotary disc thing that just mulched and exploded the trees. And I did that about five years ago, but I was noticing like, lots of little trees starting to grow in the pasture. So I wanted to burn that because it's pretty easy to kill the cedars when they're little. These, this is, look at the surrounding land though. That's mm -hmm. all cedar. Mm -hmm. wow. So, so when we do a prescribed burn, it's it's really a detailed thing. With, through the NRCS, you get forms that you fill out that is a prescribed burn plan, or we are, you know, we contact all the neighbors. We tell them what we're going to do. We won't do it unless the wind is in just the right direction. And there, there may be a couple different acceptable directions. We we make sure we have enough manpower, enough equipment. Everybody knows where the gates are at in case things get out of hand and you need to escape. So it's, it's really, and on, as you watch the weather for sometimes for weeks till it gets to be just right, and not just the day you burn, you have to look at the weather when it's going to be like for two or three days after that so that you don't have high wind gusts that could send a sh shower of sparks you know, when nobody's there. So it's really a, a detailed thing to, to do a prescribed burn and uh, done, done well. So have you done that already? Yeah, oh. yeah, so this is at our place. And um, okay. the, we had, because we have so much rain, I wanted to burn a couple weeks earlier, but we couldn't because the conditions weren't right per our burn plan. <clears throat> so there was quite a bit more bone grass growing up there that green that's made it so the fire burns slower but sometimes that's good because it kills more things you know when it's a slow fire and we're trying to kill the bone and kill the cedar and that will help promote native species <clears throat> and so this was this is the day after and all those little orange things those are all little cedar trees that are already dying because they're they're mm -hmm. orange Hopefully they're dying. <laughs> <laughs> and this was taken last night. This is three weeks later. So it's amazing how quickly it comes back. And, and I can already tell there's more forbs and stuff starting to sprout and come up. Still a lot of brome, but um, it's dramatic how, 
how quickly it's coming back. Um, so that's that's the eastern red cedar. So I have a question yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I have some small trees starting, um, and I'm just wondering, you know, like if, if we take a change and pull them out, would that help? All, all you have, if you don't have too many, if you're not dealing with thousands of them, if you just cut them at ground level, they will die. If you leave even one little branch of green, it'll live. You have to get all the green off of a cedar, but it will not re-sprout from its front if you cut it off. So I can take it in my nippers or yeah. off, whatever it is. Yeah. Do you have a weed eater? Yeah. A straight shaft? Um, actually, mine is a push one. Okay. I was going to say what I I used initially on for the small was I got a steel weed eater with a steel blade. Right. Mm -hmm. And I did. Go in there and, and get, yeah, get them up about the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're up about like that, and that works. Yeah. Then do you need to like pour vinegar over it? Or no, anything? nothing. Okay. Just get rid of the vegetation; it'll die. Okay. And it's very heat sensitive. Um, when they're adult trees, if you don't have enough fuel underneath them and the fire doesn't get intense enough, the adults may live. Um, so sometimes you go in and you cut a bunch of the adult trees and you bank the trees into the kind of the main main growth. If you can get a like enough heat going, then you can catch the whole thing on fire. And another word for the wise, when you cut them, cut them at ground level or as close as you can, because otherwise you have a, a whole bunch of little things that are gonna pop your tires when you go drive in that pasture. They're like, it's just, they really cause flats easy, easily. So you don't need to get the roots off then at all? No, no, not the eastern red cedar. The whole tree will die if you just cut it off and get rid of its vegetation. So do they have like a taproot or do they have the surface off? More surface off. Surface. More surface. So they're, they're pretty easy to kill, but it's a, it's a classic example. Deal with it early um, because if you don't, it just turns into this very bad forest. So Siberian elm, I grew up in Edgemont, out West River, Fall River County. This was the only tree we had in town, I swear. And it was kind of, we tried to climb them and they were disgusting because there was always the saps out of them and your hands would stink and they were dirty, but it was a tree, you know. And, <laughs> so, but it had it become invasive in a lot of places in South Dakota, um, in grasslands as well as other places. And it makes just a ton of seeds, like in the spring and early summer, um, these seeds would be everywhere. And it's depicted on the right hand side. So it's kind of a trash tree, but it was brought here because it'll grow in just about any situation, you know, very little water, uh, very bad soil, <laughs> um, but it's, um, Another example, uh, West City Limit Road, about 15th, uh, 15th Street on the west side. That's all. That's how you're <laughs> we always called it Chinese Elm when I was a kid. But, <laughs> um, salt Cedar, um, this is uh, around here. I don't know how much of it's around here, but it is from what I've heard. And this is an example of a uh, probably from climate change, this has been gradually moving kind of north and east out of the southwest. This was much more a typical tree in the southwest. It was introduced for landscaping, windbreak, and um, its characteristic is that it's also an allelopathic, kind of prevents other things from growing, and it really is thirsty. It can, you can get the salt cedar to come into an area that's kind of a spring or you know, source of water for animals and stuff. And these things, the plant can take about 200 gallons of water a day. Mm -hmm. It can actually drop the uh, ground water mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. I know up in uh, Williston, North Dakota, by the library, the foundation yeah. of the library kept having, um, you know, getting compromised because it was damp. They planted a couple of those and it solved the problem. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did that evolve? Crazy. Did that evolve in a saline environment that it takes up so much water? It it is. Um, well, see, I'm not sure if I have a thing about where it came from. 
Yeah. But oh, almost, that's okay. Just, almost all of these are from Asia. And yeah, because they the the roots are adapted to yeah. do it excess proton pumping and bring in more water. Yeah. Than, yeah, and, and I think that's part of the reason they're coming to this allelopathic is that they do increase the saline level in their local environment too. They oh, kind of okay. they make they it salty too. Okay. So and it's good. kind of an attractive tree when it's in bloom and stuff, but it's really become a big problem and it's quite hard to kill. Um, we were down around the Rio Grande a couple winters ago and the entire shoreline was either salt cedar or phragmites. It's just incredible how the, the the habitat, even the national park, is impacted so much down there in these invasives. Russian olive, another tree that's very hardy, and so you know it was planted in a lot of shelter belts. Um, but we've come to realize that it's now showing up in places where it's not wanted, and um, but it became. It took two to five decades to really escape. So it sort of behaved for a while, but once it reaches critical mass or something, it becomes more invasive again, perhaps from climate change. And that's going to be something to talk a little bit more about. Um, but not much heats it. You know, this is an example of some things that can eat the little olive things, but usually just for real generalized bird species and, and doesn't offer much to most of the birds and animals. And the, sp the spikes on that thing, when you're chasing cows, it's just not good. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is one that uh, Coral, Coral and I have talked a lot about, and we've been looking for these now for a couple of years, because when I first made this slide, I reported it had been identified in vermilion. Well, it was already here. <laughs> we just didn't know it until we started looking for it. And it's a, it, it's a pretty distinctive tree when you see it in leaf. Um, the things you might confuse it with would be a sumac or a black walnut, because it is what's called compound leaf. The leaf is about this long, but it's comprised of kind of a stem-like thing with a bunch of little leaf-like things. Altogether, that's the leaf. Um, and it, um, in the winter, it's not that hard to tell from because it makes a real distinctive scar when the leaf falls off. It's kind of a heart-shaped scar. And um, the, the real thing that you can tell when you look at the underside of the leaf, there's two little dark spots at the base of the leaf that um, are quite distinctive. The reason, this is a concern for several reasons. Um, I've seen it like in the alleyway right by Rexall. Uh, there's, quite a few tree of heaven, little trees growing up out of a cement foundation. It can grow in almost any environment, but it'll break the foundation. It's really hard on buildings if these things start to get um, established. Um, it's really a problem east of us right now. Because it is a very important, um, uh, what should I say? Uh, in, yeah, host plant, thank you. It's an important host plant for the, um, the, the little critter here called a spotted lantern fly. And it's kind of pretty, you know, when you see one, but the trouble is they come by the millions. And that, that picture that I have here, so that tree was covered with those insects. Oh. That's not the bark. That's, those are all insects. And when they, Back in like Pennsylvania and Ohio and in the Northeast and stuff, where they're really having problems with them, they also make a lot of kind of honeydew material that gets on cars and on lawn furniture, and then it gets this black sooty fungus all over it. Um, it's just disgusting, and, and and there's been some state parks and stuff out there that, um, in certain parts of the summer, just they can't use them. They're so overrun with this insect. So we have the tree of heaven here already. And the thing about this insect is it lays egg clusters on anything, the, the grill of your car, on a trailer. And so we could very easily see this move to South Dakota just from a passing car, like that hatches. And then these things happen to find one of these tree of heavens. And, we found them pretty often 
here in town, um, even out in the country, I, I found a real fairly large infestation of them coming up along the river. There's quite a few of these, so it would, but there's not that many. It would be it would be doable to get rid of all the trees in heaven right now, and instead of having a, uh, a a huge problem in the future, now is the time that if there was a will to do it. Um, could, you could thwart this problem in its early stages without that much effort. Um, so does that lavender fly go to other trees too? Or eventually it does. And the, the, the danger to agriculture is that it can just decimate crops and orchards and even forests. It's, it's really a economically impactful pest. So there's lots of reasons to, to nip it in the bud. And, We've actually communicated with the guy in Pier that's sort of in charge of this, and he said, eh, you know, there's a lot of hose trees to this, and they, they, you know, it's in Ohio, but they have found they found some larval forms of this in Iowa within the past year, so it's close already. Um, this is uh, what they think is the going to be the distribution. You can see we're still in a kind of a low low potential distribution, but it's getting closer all the time. <clears throat> and a lot of people just haven't really, really uh, heard of it. So that's part of, you know, Coral and I wanted to talk about that in, in this venue here, just so we get the word out. Just watch out. Um, so we're just going to talk about a couple of this more contemporary stuff that's, that you can still buy all of these things in nurseries, or you can buy them online. And, talk a little bit about these. So um, before we do that, though, um, there's this notion of, of kind of sleeper species that are out there, not really posing a problem right now. But if we have some warming, we have fewer um, cold nights, or we have more hot days, that can really change the behavior of some of the plants that we have either with us now or very close by. So this this uh, slide's again kind of focused on kudzu, but it's talking about the fact that with climate change, they're expecting right now it's just kind of occasionally you see some kudzu up in the northeast and the mid-Atlantic part of the United States. They're expecting kudzu to just keep moving north um, because of climate change. And then a couple interesting things here um, on the bottom. Uh, one of the ways we can reduce the spread of these sleeping species is by starting to recognize that it's a lot smarter to plant native species instead of um, non-natives. Um, it, it will probably help prevent problems in the future. Um, this is out of UMass at Amherst. Um, They've been, they've been researching this for quite a few years, and they're really finding that plant nurseries um, have some responsibility in, um, in kind of driving the, the invasive species problem because they basically are in it to make money. And uh, even if there's, there's a lot of places that even if they realize this is, could be a problem or it is a problem, you know, if people are asking for it, they will sell it to them. And there's many examples of plants like this, and we'll kind of get into some of those now. Um, this is one, I just want to walk you through a situation with Siberian squill, because I have, I have found this just north of our house in a, in a forested area. And um, it's around, and, and this is the plant that you can buy at the nursery. This is showing Siberian squirrels starting to come up in the spring next to a, um, a, a type of plant that is can be native in South Dakota, the trout lily. Um, not very many of them around. This is a little bit later. It, it, it blooms really early. It can still be snow on the ground, and you'll, you can see the squill. It's really pretty. It's nice to see some blue. You know, you're sick of winter. Oh, there's a pretty flower, and uh, that's why it gets planted. Um, but it likes to spread, and it likes to likes to reproduce. And so, it, you know, you got it in your bed. It does this, 
and then, oh man, next year, maybe a couple years, maybe 10 years. But you start to notice it in clusters where nobody ever planted it and because it makes lots of seeds. It, um, you know, it propagates both sexually and asexually. So sexually is making the seeds, you know, flowers get pollinated, it makes seeds, seeds spread. That's genetic diversity because different individuals contribute, you know, their DNA to the whole process. But there's asexual propagation too, where the roots spread out long distances. So maybe a lot of plants, um, you know, their, their branch will touch the ground. And next thing you know, that branch is rooted and created another tree. That's asexual. That's basically a clone of that plant. It's not got as much genetic diversity, but it still propagates. Um, and this is what's happened in, in, in areas where this is really turned into a big problem. It starts to smother out everything else. It kind of looks pretty for a little while. You know, the blooms don't last that long, but this is what you have later in the summer, just a carpet of green that anything else struggles to get through. Um, this, this is a plant that uh, I guiltily have to say I've planted numerous barberries <laughs> or had them planted. I mean, this is a go-to but for most landscapers because it, it, it survives, it looks pretty. Um, you know, it's, there's some nice red seeds that look pretty in the winter. Some birds eat it and stuff. But what they have found, and I'm curious, I'm really curious about this, whether any of you have seen this in our own local area, because it's a problem, that's a fairly big problem already in Minnesota and states bordering us. And there's a good chance it'll happen to us if it isn't already happening. But the Japanese barberry from Berberus fungerii um, is the problem. Um, and, but there was a, interestingly, there was another barberry that uh, was introduced about the same time called the common barberry that was planted as uh, in shelter belts and things as we were homesteading South Dakota and farming, but they quickly recognized at SDSU, or it wasn't called back then, at the State College and the USDA, that common barberry was a host plant for a rust that was decimating the wheat crop in South Dakota. <laughs> and so the Department of Agriculture and the powers that be said, we're gonna eliminate all common barberry in the state of South Dakota and over several decades, they did that. The, the farmers were on the lookout for it. There was a huge education campaign to identify that, that, that shrub, that bush, and tear it out and kill it. And they basically got rid of it, and they saved the wheat, in the, the wheat agriculture of the state at the time. So it was an example of when there's a will to do something because there's such a financial uh, loss um, that's happening, you know, we, we can do some amazing things. They got rid of that kind of barberry at the time. The barberry that we have now, the Japanese barberry, doesn't host that, that rust, so it's not a problem. Um, but it's been uh, out, some states do outlaw plants, and this barberry has been outlawed on the East Coast in several states already because it's such a problem. Um, it's uh, escaped and established in 31 states, most invasive in the Northeast right now, but it's, they found established um, uh, thickets of this stuff as far west as Wyoming. So it's probably here in South Dakota as well. There are two cultivars though that are better behaved, and uh, that's uh, the Crimson Pygmy and Aurea. And uh, it's a smaller, more compact type of barberry that if, if the person wanted to plant that in their landscape, that, those would be the cultivars to do. Some, sometimes cultivars, though, in my reading, they can become hybridized with less well-behaved, uh, in this case, barberries, and then they, they turn into something different. So the, 
a nursery can say, yeah, this is a cultivar that, that won't, won't do something. But with time, the genetics can change and it may start to do things you don't want it to. Um, an alternative that looks really nice, it's a native species, is nine mark. So if you're needing something similar, some similar coloration and everything, this would be a, a good one. And there's a cultivar group for nine bark developed at SDSU. It's a nice plant. Um, another one, we have, we have a bunch of this at home too, burning bush. I love the way it looks in the autumn. It's gorgeous. Um, but it's a problem. Um, again, I don't know how much of a problem it is here, but it's a problem very close to us already. And so it's another one that uh, probably not such a good idea to, to plant this type of euonymus. Um, and uh, I also wanted to, uh, they didn't really, really recognize this was a problem, even though it was introduced 1860, it wasn't until the 1970s that people started to say, hey, you know, it's showing up in the forest, or we never planted it. So it's taken a long time. Um, a lot of these things, when they show up in the forest and stuff, the native, native animals often don't eat it, or they don't like it very much. And so if it starts to become a predominant part of the the, the flora of a, an area and the deer aren't eating it, it just puts more pressure on the native species to become the food source. So it's another way it impacts, has far reaching impacts other than just spreading physically. Um, this is what's happening with uh, the burning bush right now. This is the part of the United States that got, has the biggest problems established. Uh, clusters of this that's invasive and, and recognized as a problem. And you can see it's just right there on the edge of Iowa already. It's almost in the South Dakota, so recognized past. So, um, and there's an alternative. There's an American burning bush. Um, this one, it's uh, also known as Wahoo. Um, not Yahoo, but Wahoo. Um, but it's more of an orangish color. It's got a fruit on it. So that would be a good alternative to the standard burning bush. Um, calorie pear. Um, again, I, I have one of these, as I mentioned, these little tiny pears are edible, but there's some birds that like them, but not that many birds. But it's an attractive tree, but it's really starting to become invasive and spread, and it's a problem. Looks really pretty in the spring. It's it's prone to splitting and breaking, which ours did. Um, but but this is what it does, you know. In, in parts places east of us, this is what they're they're seeing happen: is that it starts to show up in thickets where it doesn't belong. It's invading. Be better plant a crab apple, you know, and there's native native uh, crab apples and some really nice native cultivars that would be a good replacement for that. Um, Japanese wisteria, really pretty plant. Um, you know, there are types uh, all kind of derived from the Japanese wisteria. Um, you know, we we can grow it uh, in our our zone. You know, we're a 5B. Um, Maybe parts of the surrounding area might be 5A, but there is an American version of wisteria that's called Kentucky wisteria that um, should be able to survive here. It'd be better to plant that instead of um, this wisteria. Um, another one, Oriental bittersweet. Um, really pretty plant. Um, we have a native called American Bittersweet. You can see this out at the state park along the bike path in the winter. When it's easy to see because it's the only orange thing. Um, to my extent, or to my knowledge, I don't think we have the Oriental one out there. Um, it's a little hard to tell them apart, but um, the, the Americans just have the, the fruit on the very ends of the stems, whereas Oriental Bittersweet will have the fruit all along the stem. And, <coughs> Or we don't, you shouldn't plant oriental bittersweet. 
And part of the reason for that is because the vines will kill other trees. They will choke them and girdle them and kill trees. Um, now more of a ground cover thing. There's a lot of this around periwinkle, vinca minor, um, vinca, vinca vine. It also is one of these allelopathic types of plants. Um, kind of keeps other things from growing, but this will pretty easily spread and jump into your lawn. And the places that really struggle with this, it's in their forests. They have acres and acres of this stuff on the floors of the forest and stuff. Kind of looks well, pretty. I've got <laughs> I, <do too. laughs> yeah. I planted some last year. <laughs> so it'd be better to pick, pick out a different and like there's a lot of native flocks that, that's beautiful and there's creeping flocks you know that uh, it, you know doesn't tend to be invasive or as invasive or more easily controlled but that would be a good alternative to doing periwinkle um honeysuckle is another one I mean, we all like the smell of that but there are places where the, the monocera species the shrub honeysuckle has really become a problem um and it um, uh, should be maybe we have a native called clove currant. It's supposed to, I've never smelled this, but it said, they say it smells like cinnamon. It's supposed to be very fragrant. So, I guess the, one of the take home messages here is that um, before you just, when you're planning maybe your spring landscaping, it'd be good to go to SDSU Extension, do a little bit of research. And um, as much as possible, try to pick native species versus non-native ornamentals. You know, we all like the color and stuff that we see with a lot of the, the not, some of the introduced uh, um, ornamental plants, but generally it's a good idea if you try to keep that to under 30% of your, your um, plantings. If you could um, plant preferentially plant native species, and you can find that through SDSU or any university, government, you know, forest service, uh, game fish and parks, nature conservancy, there's lots of really reputable sources. Um, probably not so good to go to nursery websites because they want to sell you something. They want to sell what they've got, and that is not going to be unbiased information. It, it, many of, much of it might be accurate, but it, there's so much good information that you know is going to be accurate. That should be where you go to do your research. And then there are so many more things we could talk about that I knew I wouldn't have time. But these are all things we should be cautious about. English ivy is a big problem in a lot of parts of the United States. Butterfly bush, Japanese knotweed, oxide daisy, shasta daisy. Norway maple morning glory, winter creeper, moss roses. These are all kind of on. A lot of people have problems with these too. It's just time to talk about them. Thank you. Yeah, I'll up my school yard. I have. You know, it's a process. You know, you're not going to get out of your whole yard, but once you're aware, you know, it's, you can gradually yeah. change things. So that's, yeah. that's the whole thing. Carl, do you want to speak about, you get the farmer's market for the band plants? Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, the Missouri Valley Master Gardener will be at a leading consumer market on June 1st, selling local ecotype seed grown native plants. So we collected the seed from a pasture out by the James River, and we will be selling the offspring, June 1st, 9 to noon. And we will also be selling at the Garden Board at that fund sale. So we will have two opportunities. And of course, we have native seeds here that you can pick up anytime. Yes. We have a presentation. So before you all leave, have, have you noticed anything? Have you noticed bar, barberry yeah. or burning bush spread? This. Yeah, that, um, uh, I think barberry is that yeah, um, smutty bear. I've seen some barberry in there. Have you? Or, I think I might have this honeysuckle in my shelter, though. How it would have gotten there, I have no idea. It was promoted in 
No, it was not planted there. Oh, really? So, no. maybe your neighbor's children. I don't know. Yeah, the bird. Yeah, the bird. So, does that honeysuckle get a berry? I mean, I just see shrubs bloom. Well, you know, and yeah. usually that's by the birds, or you don't see dispersion by wind yeah. and stuff like that. That's what happens. And even if you don't, even if you have an invasive species and you see, oh, it's not in my yard, that doesn't mean a bird didn't go poop to see it a mile away. Yeah, that's yeah. how it spreads. So we, can I just cut it down and it'll? You, you would have, you know, I didn't get into all of the mitigation, just look but, it up. but you could look it up. <laughs> you would know how to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> All I was going to say is, you know, most of this is our own fault. The Siberian elm, the Russian olive, many of those were introduced during because uh, during the 20s, everybody wiped everything out, and then we had the dust bowl. Yeah. And so they promoted shelter belts and uh, field roads and, and stuff like that. Well, Siberian arm, uh, elm, and Russian olive. Uh, purple loose stripe was actually introduced as a landscaping plant. Broke out from grass, really out of broke out, facing out. You know, it's all, you know, we weren't thinking at the time we do it. You know, and we, we look at it from from our lens here, we see all of these Asian and European species that have invaded us. But if you travel the world, there's lots of our species that have been invaded by them. Yeah, and I've grown up here in Yankton. I don't know if anybody can remember back in the 50s and 60s where we have the uh, Chinese uh, or the uh, elm disease. Yeah. And we had we have to put, they put a sticky band around the elm to keep the bugs Growing yeah. up. Now we have uh, the uh, yeah. ash borer. How are you going to keep the ash borer? You, know, you yeah. go down along any river or creek, you're going to find wild ash. Yes. Yeah. All we can do is no. slow its progress. Yeah. yeah. And what, and what, go ahead. Well, another thing when we do plant trees, diversity, part of the problem with the loss of the American elm and the loss of the ash is monoculture you, you oh it grows well so let's plant yeah. plant only that or yeah and 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 so then then that sets it up for disease yeah. distribution and, quite easily and, and dr ball always <laughs> makes the point that um don't just plant maple because yeah. there's lots of maple in china and <laughs> chinese past the That'll be the next thing. They'll, so something plan, will come. It'll be plan a lot of diversity. Diversity. Yeah. Diversity is good. Half berries and oaks. Half berries and oaks. <laughs> What's that? They're half berries and oaks. Yeah. They, yeah. They support the most native. Yep. Uh, for oak. Wildlife. That's all right. Good. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I spent yesterday afternoon reading my photograph and it's a lot of my work for Chinese because they plant it out on the ground.